So I'm a great believer in uh, transitional objects and the I idea behind that, Bob. Uh, yeah, and the idea behind them. Yeah. What it means. Yeah. Uh, um, There's something in me, and I don't know where it's come from. It's obviously no. my past, and I have no idea. But it, I don't know whether a fear is is too strong a sentence to use. But that the client somehow is using a crutch or using me as a crutch. Crutch for what? For moving on. I, I don't know that that connection that can be seen sometimes maybe as a crutch. Yeah, depends. Oh, like it's what you... kind of like we've done the work. Go and be free and enjoy your life. Depends so... what you mean by crutch. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is the Therapy Show, behind closed doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 84 with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful, knowledgeable Mr. Bob Cook. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about transitional objects in the psychotherapy process. Gosh, is it is it really 84 that we've done? 84, yeah. Oh my gosh, I can hardly believe that. That's unbelievable. I'm going to come, I think we should congratulate ourselves and 84, what a number. One Do you of my know, favorite... the average podcast doesn't last more than seven weeks? No, I didn't know that. Well, there's a statistic for you. And we've been going for 84 weeks. People start podcasts and literally the average, they only last about a couple of months, seven to eight weeks. Wow. Hey, I want to give you another statistic I read about in The Guardian. Oh, go on. Uh, I don't read The Guardian. Four or five months ago. And it said the average life of a psychotherapist stroke counsellor is 11 years. Wow. Oh, I'm coming up to the end of mine then. <laughs> yeah, I did 38. So I was completely... Can you imagine that? Only 11 years. So, well, that's an interesting six that you gave and I was quite blown over when I found out it was only 11 years. Yeah. To do four years of training, four years plus years of training to use it for 11 years, that's it's not a very good statistic, that, is it? I don't know if it's even true, but I don't know where they got it from. I think they were looking at therapists in the NHS. Oh, right. Well, I can understand that. <laughs> Which makes really a bit say more that but it makes a bit more sense. It's a bit conveyor beltish, in, in it? There's kind of a lot, lot of clients in and out, and yeah, I would, yeah. And perhaps they were even call calling the therapeutic component of social workers. I don't know where. I didn't. I didn't look to the bottom of the article mm -hmm. now to. I'm talking to you to find out where they got their information from. Yeah. But either way, 11 years is, you know, very small, I think. Well, you did amazing then, Bob. Well done, you. Yeah. And you're still involved in it now. I think you'll always have a finger in the pie some way or another. Yes, my 72nd year. Yeah. Yeah. You'll, you'll be going longer than the rest of us. So on to transitional objects. You're yes. my transitional object, Bob. This podcast is my transitional object. Yes. You, you've pinched my beginning. That's where Sorry. I... No, that's fine. Yeah, for all the... Yes, that's right. So it's... it's yeah. Transitional object comes from um, a very famous psychoanalyst, as a term, I mean, a very famous psychoanalyst who coined the term transitional object, and that was... I think he did. Uh, I've always thought anyway, but uh, that's Donald Winnicott, who was a famous child psychoanalyst writing a lot in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. And he talked about trans transitional objects. Um, I, I think people then went on to talk about trans trans you know, transitional, transitional situations as well. Um, but it's the idea that, um, <clears throat> that we can give somebody an object so that the receiver has the person who gave the object to them in their mind. Yeah. So my therapist, when I first went into therapy, I don't know how long, say it was about, gosh, I don't know, about a year in, 
And I remember the fact that I was going on a holiday or something like that. Can't remember why I was, I must have been I was going on holiday. Or she, oh no, she was going on holiday. And she gave me uh, a bracelet. And she said, you know, I, I am gonna be coming back and please, um, you know, this for me to you to, re to remind you, you can touch it and think yeah. about it. And, uh, I can have it, I'll have it back when I come back. Um, uh, so, you know, to psychological level, yeah, that I will be coming back. So in other words, you take for that bracelet, isn't just a bracelet. It has the psychological significance, significance of the positive presence of the other. Yeah. Now, I was, I think I've said in another podcast, I was adopted. So I had a lot of attachment issues, uh, a lot of where my real mother didn't come back. Yeah. So that's in the, so I'm sharing something in the significance of what it meant therapeutically. Yeah. And it is quite that. powerful to have one to be given an object like that and, and two to have that connection with the person, even though they're not there. Oh, oh. Yeah. So they so they end up being there, just switching this. Uh, yeah, they end up they are. Yeah. So the transitional object is an object of psychological significance. Yeah. Yeah. And I've experienced it in, you know, different walks of life. I, one of the first jobs that I had um, was a nursery nurse. And often the children would come with a transitional object, whether it was, a, a you know, the favourite blanket or, you know, something familiar from home. They would bring that in with them every day to nursery. That's right. So Winnicott, who was a child psychotherapist, I'm going back to where the term comes from. Um, I know all mothers and fathers of God children will know what I'm going to talk about now, is that very young in their lives, I don't know, one and a half, two, something like that, um, you know, kids, toddlers, like to have a, a blanket or yeah. a handkerchief or something which reminds them of their mother yeah. or father or yeah. security. Or I think that's what a lot of it is about: is safety and security. Something yeah. familiar, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and they will, will, will carry them with them. And um, I was just um, reading, I think, or perhaps it was on television. Um, it's about the toddlers in the Ukraine war mm. that's happening at the moment with Russia, and um, you know, some toddlers being found and. They were clinging on to their, you know, teddy bear or their yeah. um, handkerchief or their mother or father, something which represented security for them. Yeah. So the garment, the object, carries huge psychological significance in terms of safety and security for the other. Yeah. Toddler. Yeah, yeah. And that's why that object was called transitional by by Winnicott and became an, a term used in counseling and psychotherapeutic parlours. Yeah. And yeah. There's often, something I was made aware of with the fostering as well. <clears throat> Let's tell me a little bit more then. Well, you know, the, the, the children would always come with the most random things. Do you know what I mean? And for me, it might be you know I don't want to say a piece of rubbish but it might be an insignificant object but to them it was something really important and it meant something to them so do you know what I mean part of our training was to never throw anything away whether it just looked like a piece of paper or a bit of newspaper whatever it was do you know what I mean like you'd go into a child's bedroom to tidy up it was really important that everything was left in there but when the, the children were leaving our care and moving on you know, we always made sure that they had a card and a, a gift from us, whether they were going back home or going on to another foster carer. Really, really, really important in terms of security, yeah. safety, psychological significance, and in fact, uh, in terms of their own identity. Mm. 
and and they're part of their history. Yes. Some of these children had moved on multiple times, you know, and I suppose depending oh. on their age, it's it's part of their history where they've been and who they've lived with and everything. So at some point in the future, they might want to put the pieces together. Yeah. I, 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 did you? I don't know what it's called. Only you know uh, some, you know, like do a book with them of favoured things or photographs or. Yeah, the local authority used to have a book about me where we could, and as a foster carer, before a new placement came, we gave them a book about us with a picture of our house and who lived in the household and pets we had and, you know, the local park, so that when they were here, things were familiar on the first day. Oh, oh. Yeah. That's really important. Yeah. I do... I've always used transitional objects a lot in therapy, um, especially when I'm away. Again, I suppose I didn't copy my therapist's process, but um, yeah, it was important for me. But you know, it's something which I think is really important of security for the other. Um, I remember I've got countless stories where I've given. <coughs> uh, valuable objects well for me she used to i remember i created and kept um gems i liked or um crystals that i liked or so that i could give give them to to, to clients not just when they went away but some clients from session to session yeah it, to be honest it's something i've never done mm. And I used to have ha have this huge silver casket full of gems and stones and crystals. And in fact, the more I'm talking now, the more I'm remembering. I did a lot specifically on therapy marathons, specifically in clients who were working aggressively with their younger self from session to session. Yeah. And sometimes I they took it away from off their left therapy and sometimes they gave it back. <clears throat> either either of those would fit into their clinical uh, treatment planning, but it, 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 they became important psychologic, psychologically. Yeah, because it's that continuity and connection, isn't it? It's, yeah. Continuity, connection, stability, identity, but I think I think psychological presence, mm. all those things. Um, I tell you what, you'll see that a lot. It's slightly different. It's away from the therapeutic room, but there's a television program my wife really likes watching, which is called the Repair Shop. Ah, oh, yeah, I love that. I cry at every episode. <laughs> yeah, and 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 people bring in um, objects. Um, which are very significant for them, and they often are objects from their own childhood, yeah. um, which have got a bit tattered, and the experts repair them. Yeah. And the people coming to collect the object or, or whatever it is, and they see it brought back to life, uh, are very emotional. Yeah, it remembers it reminds them in terms of what you're talking about continuity, yeah. their history, the people who gave it them, that sense of um, process. So it's in the same ballpark. It is, it is, and it's interesting on that program. And I'm presuming <clears throat> things, you know, in in the real world, is that they don't want it to look brand new. They want it to still look a bit battered and a bit tattered around the edges. So yeah. it shows the history of how far it's come and who it's belonged to and things. So that's, that's it's, it's the same sort of in the ballpark of psychological, psychological significance. Now, in the therapeutic world, you, you will, you'll decide clinically, but uh, they may just keep the transitional object for one session three sessions yeah. till they leave therapy and give it back again yeah part of a therapeutic process but sometimes i've said just keep it and even you know 
even if you see therapy as a stage of your life, you might look back at it sometime and remember me and what we've achieved and where you've come. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, that, I, I quite, I like that. Oh, oh. As, a, as a reminder to them. Yeah. Oh, oh. I think one of the um, relational needs we all have, and certainly Richard Erskine, who was a mentor of mine, um, talked about, was the relational need to express love. And I know many, 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 many of my therapists, when they've left therapists, might often bring a present or something like that. And of course, in our ethical code, you know, we aren't allowed to accept presents particularly. And I know in social work codes and many others, they aren't allowed to either. So there's a whole clinical thought about it all. However, if it's something of a smaller significance, I may well accept it. So if it yeah. was, you know, some sort of, I don't know, crystal or something. Yeah. Um, see, our clients have the relational need to express love as well here. And I think often, as I said, the transitional objects are from the heart. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because it is a relationship that we have. Obviously, it's a therapeutic, ethical relationship, but it is a relationship. And to to decline a thoughtful gift is, you know, it's quite disempowering for the other person. Yeah, and it has to be, of course, within, you know, uh, not of much monetary significance. Exactly, yeah. It's, it's more thoughtful like, than... Yeah, poem or... Yeah, yeah. Or, I just think when I uh, when I finished, you know, I was thinking the people I finished with, somebody put me a very small book of poems um, that they'd written through therapy. Yeah. And yeah. that was the expression of love. Yeah. So I think, I think, uh, I know we have boundaries and ethics and everything else, but these transitional objects have a certain clinical, you know, thoughts you know with them in terms of providing continuity identity psychological stability and um, are really useful, yeah. useful to reflect on um, for therapists to think about how to use them clinically yeah and particularly i quite like the idea of the casket that you had oh. you know if the client chose what they wanted out of that casket that meant something to them or a colour that they yeah, liked they or a yeah. size or whatever it is, then, you know, there's a real connection with it, with you, with the therapy, with everything. Yeah. I think if you talk about potency, then what you've just described there, in my experience, has a high level of potency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm a great believer in uh, transitional objects and the I idea behind that, Bob. Them. Yeah, and the idea behind them. Yeah. What it means. Yeah. Uh, and... There's something in me, and I don't know where it's come from. It's obviously yeah. in my past, and I have no idea. But it, I don't know whether a fear is, is too strong a sentence to use, but that the client somehow is using a crutch or using me as a crutch. Crutch for what? For moving on. I, I don't know. That that connection that can be seen sometimes maybe as a crutch. Yeah, it depends. Like it's what... kind of like we've done the work, go and be free and enjoy your life. It depends so... what you mean by crutch. That they can't live without the therapist in their life. You oh, know, okay. So you mean the one you're, yeah. you're talking about over dependability? Yeah, something around that, yeah, yeah. Is that what you mean? I think so. Yeah. 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 So, for a lot of clients I saw, in in their lives, they'd never had anybody who was dependable. Yeah. Uh, they'd been let down. Life had been unpredictable. They'd been abused, neglected, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So actually to find a therapist that was dependable was remarkable. Yeah. So I th 
thought it was very important, and I still do, to cultivate dependability. Now, of course, there's many articles written about the negative, so-called negativity of that. And I think that's what you're talking about, where I think that's why you use those words, where the client can become over-dependent so they don't actually uh, move on. Yeah. Now, in the context of what you're just talking about here, has that thought process come from what we're talking about in terms of transitional objects? How did you get there? I, 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 I think it's always been there with me being a therapist that to empower the client to be okay without me if that makes sense yeah no i i think that's completely right by the way but i think there's a process to it yes yeah and and i you can go and i don't think that. it's good clinically if you move from a to z yeah 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 it's a process, not an event. One of my favourite sayings, but I think I it's that really saying. Is. I used that today with somebody, but it, it's about you know I couldn't have done this without the, you. You're the one that well, maybe it's true. Me. By the way, all yeah. those thoughts yeah. say I don't know. No, no, seriously, I think for many, many people, with when they come along and they have a really strong relationship with a, a, a really competent, good therapist, they might not have been able to do it without them. I mean, no. there's a there's a truth in that surely i mean if, if they hadn't gone to therapy and they carried on perpetuating their script they could end up in exactly the same place for years and years and years and years and years so i think coming to therapy having that co-creative relationship and somebody who believes in them somebody who who's been a trained professional can take them to a certain process has certainly played a part in helping them change of course it's them that changes i understand that but the client does, sorry, the therapist does play a part, even if it's only as a witness. Well, yes, a witness or an agent of change or something. I don't know, but it, maybe it says a lot about my my script. It, but, you know, the transitional object somehow just connects with me about there being a, a crutch or, or something that the client can't. What about okay? Let's if I reframe that. I don't want to discount your. No, no, and it, I, 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 if I wanted to reframe that. I'd like to think of transitional objects as the agent of transformational change. Yeah, I, I, I love it, and I think doing this podcast has kind of given me permission that it's okay to have transitional objects and to use those in a therapy as, session. as agents of transformational change. Yeah. In other words, they provide the mechanism or to, to, to help the person um, achieve transformational you know, change, if you want to do it that way. Yeah. So they're part of transformation rather than um, some negative process. Yeah. Or I know what it is. Or a fear of infantilization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I think the opposite. I think it can help people move away from infantilization to transformation. Yes, and I suppose the more I'm thinking about it, and the more I'm talking it about, it's about the intention that's behind it as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think you see. I think it's really important because I know so many therapists that people accuse of infantilization. And I know that some therapists that actually, I think, spends too much time in the regressive places and actually may, uh, you know, fall into that process. And I also want to say that, and we're talking about transversal objects particularly here, that they can be used in terms of the opposite of that, helping a person uh, work through their relational needs and grow up yeah yeah because again that is part of therapy is modeling appropriate relationships and then ending those relationships appropriately yeah the world won't end if we do that yeah, yeah. that is why some therapists will insist on the client giving back the transitional objects as a symbol yeah 
of growing up and being adult. Yeah. Yeah. So, Good so tool to use. Oh. Yeah. Well, you know yourself, you work in foster homes. Yes. Yeah. 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 And we we did always, you know, give them something to to move on with or whatever. Yeah. So it's interesting, isn't it? It is. It is very interesting. Mm. Yeah. What a wonderful topic. Have we we haven't got a, a one for the next one, have we, Bob? We've not decided. Well, I, I sent a list to you. You but... did. I think we've gone through most of them, Bob. You know, no. we're doing okay. Okay. Well, I'll send you another few. Well, one that I I would like to do, which I think is quite good, that we've written down here, is mistakes in the therapy process. Okay. Let's have mistakes in the therapy process. You sure we haven't done it? I don't think so. Okay. No. If you haven't done it, let's do that. And I'll send you two or three more. Okie dokie. Right. So that'll be episode eighty-five. Mistakes. I like making mistakes. <laughs> Oh look, how can people learn if you don't make mistakes? So but let's I'll save that to the conversation uh on the next podcast. Yeah, none of us are perfect, Bob. No. Oh, that's absolutely true. Thank goodness. Yeah. Who who'd want to be perfect? Oh, I could, oh that's let's leave it for the po <laughs> okay, okay. the podcast. Until next time, Bob. Yeah, yeah. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye Thank you. Bye. <laughs> You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.